Material for the Brain Conversations for Thinking Bodies Hello and welcome to Material for the Brain, episode number 18. My guest for today is Stephanie Lee, an entrepreneur and a contemporary dancer. She is the co-founder of Tribe Gym in Hong Kong, a playground for circus, weightlifting, mobility training, and acrobatics. I met Stephanie in 2018. She invited me to teach a seminar in her gym, and from the first moment we met, we had a really great time together. I was extremely impressed by her groundness and her ability to connect to the real world while remaining in touch with her creative and artistic expressions. And even though she was relatively younger than me, I really felt immature next to her and our meeting helped me to discover new ways to grow. In our conversation, Stephanie shared her experiences of being an Asian immigrant to the US and the achievement mindset it cultivated. We talked about the different values in Western culture and Asian culture and how it shapes the expectation within one's nuclear family. We looked at our common training background in contemporary dance and at the current trend of dancers picking up Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. We talked about self-defense and the challenge of internalizing martial art technique for the real world. It was a really inspiring conversation that challenged certain assumption I had on the topic I've mentioned. So I was very grateful to have it and I hope that you will find value in it as well. Now, before we start, I want to apologize as the audio quality from the recording is not the best. And if you are listening to the audio version, it might be challenging at times to fully understand Stephanie. So I would recommend you to watch the video version as it is much easier to understand when you can see Stephanie while she speaks. So without further delay, here is Stephanie Lee. Hello, Stephanie. How are you? Welcome to my podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Matan. It's, it's really a pleasure. I just haven't seen you in so long. And just your voice is just like, yeah. <laughs> it you back. Yeah. yeah, I'm also super happy to see your smiling eyes and to have some time to hear what is going on with you. And yeah, we haven't seen, yeah, for... Quite some time. Last time in Castle, no? Yes. How many years was it? I think at least two. Um, at least two years. Yeah, I haven't traveled very widely um, since the Hong Kong protests. If uh, people still remember that. Um, and then obviously, I actually did travel during COVID. I actually did travel. Yeah, that was fun. Mm. Yeah, I'm also starting to get used to COVID traveling. Yeah. It's a different thing. Yeah, it must be. Especially because you have kids. So that's also a different story. Yeah, I mean, I had the virus, so I'm less kind of worried about getting it. But just this whole connecting, traveling to so much bureaucracy and preparation and lack of spontaneity. And it's a <laughs> it's not easy. It's, it's especially, yeah, so I, I definitely echo that. And especially when you already come from a place that feels that, um, I, I wouldn't say like Hong Kong, the freedom in Hong Kong has, has been compromised in, you know, in terms of just socially. If you're involved in politics, then you definitely feel a bit like strangled in a way. And, uh, if, you, if you are, if you're really, um, again, involved in a lot of what's happening in Hong Kong, but even like bystanders, I think um, Hong Kong has been hit really hard because we had a lot of good people in terms of um, the social, political uh, scene. We had a lot of people coming out to protest against like, with the reform and with the national security law that has been enacted um, this year. Um, a lot of things have kind of died down, but like you know, it meant that we were kind of like this already. Uh, if this was our baseline morally and emotionally and spiritually, if this was our energy, then we went to COVID just here. So uh, like the city has definitely felt very drained from both the protests and then 
the aftermath of COVID, I would say. But things are definitely good. So, so what is ha- what is going on with you nowadays? Like, what are you up to? Uh, I am in recovery. I am in very <laughs> recovery. I actually kind of enjoy the isolation. Uh, I enjoy this very obvious excuse to just withdraw from life for a little bit, because um, I was also dealing with some personal stuff. Uh, I think now I'm starting to come out of my shell. So, so just to catch you up a little bit, and that sounds like very fluffy. But um, so I run a tribe, and uh, I was away from my, I was separated from my partner for almost six months um, because we were in a long distance relationship. So we got married over COVID, um, and he moved here. And so now I'm in kind of the chunks of building a life with someone. He was also an artist, who was also a dancer. And I am working with my team to rebuild the company and to rebuild the community here. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a process of rebuilding and just like coming out of isolation. So wait, your gym now is open? Is it functioning or like what's going on practically? That's actually, so Hong Kong is really interesting in the sense that we never had a full walk. We've had 14 different establishments closed, but we have never actually had a full lockdown. So we were allowed to go out to shopping malls and restaurants were still open, but gyms, hair salons, and uh, massage, massage places were closed. Yeah. So really my, my gym was among those businesses affected, but there were also a lot of businesses that were not affected. that were actually doing really well during COVID. Um, who were kind of like one of the unlucky sectors. Uh, now my gym is open, but we were closed for six months. Okay, so now there are like live classes again and like people coming in. So is it a nice feeling to be back there? Yeah, yeah, it really is. Uh, I, I definitely didn't realize how much I missed being with other people. Especially, yeah, even with the mask on, I'm still not really using the mask because it hides so much, so much of our expression. And I, I work with kids primarily, so communicating to them with the mask has been really difficult. Yeah, it's just it's just getting used to it. I'm not. I'm still not really used to all of the restrictions. Oh, it's super interesting. You know, like just just what you're saying, like. I prefer not to use the mask because it hides so much facial expression, you know, like where, where I am living, you know, like resisting to that would be such a strong, strongly associated with like a political thing. And like, we completely lost the ability to look at those simple things that are also part of it, you know, yeah, facial expression is quite important when it comes to communication. Yeah, I see it because I go to the kindergarten of my kids. Where my son goes, it's like uh, it's managed by the parents, so we are quite involved, and we decided as a group to enter with the masks. So the teacher don't have the mask, but we as parents, we have the mask. And yeah, actually, it's quite awkward to I don't know if there is some kind of a situation that I want to attend with the kids. <laughs> you're like kind of uh, behind. It's like very formal and weird. Yeah, and it's also at the age where they're supposed to be learning all of these expressions. And so I'm trying, like, one of my biggest challenges is to communicate quality because I do use a lot of my face and my gestures and I'm like, oh, strong. You know, how do you communicate strength to a child? How do you communicate, like, trying to be smooth and trying to think and all these intonations in our voice that I feel gets lost even with a mask. And just, and just to be clear, like, we've been wearing it here since January of last year. And I actually started wearing the mask, like, late January onwards, all the way until now. So I'm, I'm really good at breathing in one. Um, I'm really good at wearing it. Like some days I forget to take it off. And I'm just like, oh, it's well on me. And some days it's really nice, you know, like I, right now I'm uh, in the middle of some legal stuff. So it's kind of nice that I have a mask to hide because most of the time my eyebrows sort of like, what are they talking about? Like. You know, you can't really see what I'm thinking because half my face is covered. So sometimes it's useful when you don't really want to 
let the other party know that <laughs> you don't understand them. <laughs> but as a teacher, yeah, yeah. it's a really big disadvantage. It's a really big disadvantage, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess if you're in the business of armed robbery, the whole COVID makes your life super exciting, no? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everybody is covered. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, super, super funny. Or like, uh, poker, yeah. And, and tell me, like, I, I, I'm, I mean, we've talked a little, we've talked about it before, but I think I've never really heard kind of the long story. And I'm curious because it can also bring our audience a little bit in, more into the episode. If you can tell a little bit, so where did you, where, where, what was your story to arrive to the position where you're now like a, a co-founder of a movement gym in Hong Kong, coming from dance background, like what was your story where you grew up? How did you get into those things? Yeah. Yeah. I'm nodding a lot because that's always the first thing people ask. And sometimes a little bit, I'm a bit insulted. I'm like, do you not think I can do this? Like... What are your biases here? Like, check them at the door, please. But it, it is actually something that's very common that people ask me. Um, so I, I would start in a different way instead of like chronologically. I think being a dancer means having to work with very little resources. And I grew up in a family that like was middle class, but probably more low middle class. So we didn't have a lot to go around. And I learned to do I learned to make do with the resources I had and to kind of um, really just like use whatever I could and find every opportunity and try to make the most of it. Uh, I was living in New York and my, at the time, friend, now co-founder, called me out of the blue after two years of not seeing each other. I was like, hey, do you want to move to Hong Kong and start a gym with me? That's how I moved. Um, that's how I came to Hong Kong. But looking back to all of the things that led to it, I wasn't very happy with where I was as a dancer. I kind of wanted to be more physical. I wanted to have my own space. I wanted to have my own community. My own community. So I was already doing projects and different things in New York that kind of culminated to me going to different workshops and me different I mean, teaching in different places abroad. Um, that led me to meeting this guy who lived in Hong Kong, who then asked me to move across continent from New York to Hong Kong. So yeah, so I think that the, the short story is I think dancers are really, are naturally actually very entrepreneurial. Um, also, that's a word that gets thrown around like way too much. Which, which word? Uh, Could you repeat? <laughs> entre entrepreneurial. Like yeah. entrepreneur, a lot of people are entrepreneurs, but have never sold a product or a service and have never led a team. And to me, you're not really an entrepreneur unless you've had, you know, one business be a success and one business be a failure. And Tribe is actually my second business. It's my, like, my favorite business by far. You know, if I had children, like, it's definitely my favorite child. But <laughs> I, I had one uh, failed startup project before Tribe. So that definitely, like, that definitely taught me more. But where did it, where did it come from? Because, you know, like, I've, I'm thinking about myself and kind of the dance environment I was in. It's quite rare to see dancers who have interest in setting up businesses or like even look at them. You know, I would argue that if you're a self-employed artist, you should look at yourself as like a business manager. You're managing your, your art vehicle whatever but uh we are so far from it so what 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 is it related to your where you grew up to your education like where did you have this kind of yeah i think i think you and i have always really connected on the fact that we're both artists but we're also very pragmatic so we see the practical side of things at the same time wanting to push our creative boundaries um my asian upbringing definitely has a huge part in that but i also went to school in boulder colorado which is a hub for startups in the US. And around 2008, 2009, there was just this big explosion of startups. And, you know, I would like walk around a local coffee shop and people would be coming in, like taking their phone, showing me the app that they just made. And, you know, I had a lot of like curiosity. 
So I actually participated in different hackathons uh, when it was still really nerdy, and I would be the only female showing up at those events. Um, and I think also it came from the fact that I'm also an immigrant. So when I moved to the U.S. for school, I was I was the only one of my family there, and I knew I had to get a visa, which meant I knew I had to get a job. So I was trying to maintain these like dance aspirations, but there was also a part of me that was like, "Girl, if you don't get a visa, you're out of here. Like you can't make any any dreams come true. You can't just stay in this country." So I was always trying to freelance, trying to find different jobs, and the jobs that were easiest, like the lowest barrier to entry, were jobs with tech startups. So that was kind of how I got my foothold. And kind of like I said, like they don't do that so much now, but I think I was really lucky in the sense where I went to school, they were really encouraging a lot of multidisciplinary collaborations. So my dance school would encourage us to collaborate with the film department and would you know encourage us to do a dual major. So I actually have three majors. I have a major in dance, journalism, and I minored in economics. I was very lucky because I was from a school that encouraged this, you know, multidisciplinary, like, try and, and do as much as you can, like, really make the most of your time here. Yeah, so it's part, like, Asian mindset, like, I gotta make it no matter what, I gotta make it. And then school, they gave me a lot of opportunities and a lot of time. Like, my professors really gave me time away from my studies to do like a part-time job and do internships at different places. And then just being by myself, being an immigrant, um, like moving to the US without my family, I think that, that helped me grow up really fast. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I have a I have a few questions. Like I mean one you just finished with this note of saying like yeah one one was my Asian background that put that was like pushing me to do as hard as I can. Do you see it as like a cultural thing or is it more related to an immigrant mindset, as you said? But is it also like something that you feel like you can withdraw the connection from your culture where you were born? Or is, I'm, I'm wondering like first, in your case, because I know it's kind of a general statement and, but for you. Yeah. Um. It's really interesting because that question is like giving me uh, an emotional reaction in some ways. Like I, I never want to to say negative things about my culture, um, but there there is this mindset of you know we are trained for we are trained to perform, but we don't really know how well we're doing. We don't really know where the goalpost is. So it's almost like yeah, you gotta work harder. You gotta work harder. But every time you do well in an exam or well in a topic or a subject in school, the standard gets higher. You know? So you work really hard to get to here, and then the standard gets higher. And you work really hard to get to here, and the goalpost just moves and moves and moves. So you never really know where you're at. Um, I think some of what I have does, does come from that. Does come from my, just people around me always telling me to work hard. and opportunities are scarce. There is that scarcity mindset where I grew up. Um, but I also see a lot of it in, like, in people that I, I, I worked with or came from different cultures. Mm. You know, interesting because I, uh, like on one hand, it's in, like, <laughs> you said like you don't, that you don't want to, that you're less interested in, in or that it makes you feel uncomfortable to to criticize the culture you're coming from. And, and that's a very interesting thing, you know, because I grew up in a place that's like, the first thing you do is like, you blame your country and like, like I do, know. I do, but the damn, yeah, it's like. I, I, I do, I do, I do. Like, if you're around me a lot, I crack so many Asian jokes. Like, I think I'm funny, but you know, maybe not. But I think in the context when I'm representing my culture, there is a sense of patriotism. There is a sense of like, especially now where, you know, Chinese people and Asian people, there is this, I, there's so much, so much of us in the media these days and it's not necessarily in the most positive light that I, I almost don't want to add to that. I see that as a responsibility to not add to that, especially when it is 
kind of university acknowledge that you know uh, the tiger mom exists and they are uh, they occur more frequently in the region that I live in versus like Europe yeah I mean, okay, this is like a really funny story where my partner and I, we had a weekend off. And I was like, oh, weekend off, okay. I can like go to jujitsu, or I can go for a hike. Oh, you know what, that like, I wanna study this like breathing course, like I'm just gonna do this. And he's like, it's a weekend off. You just And you know, it just occurred to me that I haven't done, I, I've never really done that. I've never really taken 48 hours and not, just to not do, just to be. But in that sense, that productivity comes from that. The productivity comes from, oh, there's an opportunity, let's grab it. Like, well, we make a pros and cons list, but you know, let's grab it, let's take it. Like, let's go for it, because we don't know when the next opportunity will come. I should, I should, first, I should set you up with my wife. She's exactly the same. Like, for me, like, uh, the, the, the perfect holiday would be like some kind of a horizontal position, next to a beach you know <laughs> just he listening to the waves and my wife is all up to like climbing conquering new <laughs> unknown territories but yeah i wonder how much it comes from a certain like also like personality and i don't know if it's i don't know if it's like if it's like a cultural byproduct or like if it's an edu or you know like if it's an environmental like i don't know if, if you say like yeah i grew up in a place where there is not a lot of opportunities so it's already a different mindset to to look at oper to, to take to to be extremely uh, ambitious and and to take a lot of responsibility about like how you handle yourself because maybe you won't make it and i don't know that's something i i do feel a lot of also differences between myself as an Israeli and a lot of people that I know that are living here in Vienna is that yeah, Vienna and in general I would say like Western Europe is it's so comfortable and there is that yeah it's very hard not to feel entitled to all this comfort where in Israel like yeah I mean first you know it's a country with conflict so the your 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 base of safety is always in some question and and I think that it's a healthy thing to not take things for granted. But on the other hand, I was also I, I also really enjoyed the fact that you could say openly, yeah, I'm I'm I, when I represent my culture, I want to show it in the best light possible. Because that's also something that I feel like that nowadays it's very problematic in in many in many Western countries to say like, yeah, I'm proud of my country. Like this is immediately like a sign of danger nationalism you know like and all the atrocities that comes with that but i think that every culture has some aspect to be proud about no and some things that are uh are to be yeah to be proud about yeah yeah no i i definitely agree on that but also i uh man i'm, I'm gonna say everything i say here culturally is from my own experience but because my grandparents were immigrants, like they moved, well, they took a boat. They actually, it's a really interesting story. They like walked six days, like something like that. They walked from Guangdong, took a ship, and then took the ship to Malaysia. So my family or my lead clan in Malaysia is considered overseas Chinese. And that is identity. It's a very, uh, how do I explain this? This is really interesting because if you think about it, my grandparents moved to a new country when this was like the 40s, let's say 40s, 50s, 40s, probably like more like 30s, 40s. Okay, so they still kept a lot of the traditional Chinese culture when they came over. And because we moved from like the motherland to different countries, we actually held these traditions like closer to us. So a lot of people, a lot of Malaysian Chinese, when we go to like now, for example, I'm living in Hong Kong, which is closer to the motherland, and you know other Malaysian Chinese uh, people in my family who have been, like Malaysian Chinese who have gone back to mainland China, like we talk about all these traditions and customs. We're like, oh yeah, like don't you do this during Chinese New Year? And they go, no, it's so old fashioned. Why would we do that? And so there's something about like because you've immigrated from the motherland to this new land. 
And you kind of keep these traditions even closer. You feel a stronger sense of pride. Um, you feel, in a sense, more nationalistic. You feel a greater responsibility to represent the motherland because you left. And I know a lot of people who in Malaysia, uh, have, I was like looking for some facts to back this up, but a lot of people in Malaysia are really pro um, the Chinese vaccine, the Sinovac. And I don't think they did their research. They're just like, oh, it's Sinovac, it's China, we gotta support China. And I'm like, you've never been to China, you're from Malaysia. You know, you like, like let's like do some fact checking here. But again, this is one example, and there's so many nuanced examples here, but they're like, yeah, just bringing on that concept of leaving the motherland and holding the traditions stronger to heart. That's like one thing. Yeah, and, and and I remember like from talking to you like that also you you shared with me this that kind of the one of the values that you grew up was that that the individual is a bit less important than the community, you know? Like that there is like a sense that you that you are not born to fulfill yourself, but you're like part of something that is bigger than you. And 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 when I think about if that's kind of your starting point. So it, it totally makes sense. And I think that it's, it's a good thing to have in mind somewhere because I think that this kind of hyper-individualistic life that is happening where I, where, you know, like <laughs> I've heard stories here about parents who when their kids kind of arrive to the age of 18, there's like, okay, I've done the, my, my, my share for you. Now, if you want to stay here at home, you have to pay rent and like, and like just... I'm not responsible for you at all. I'm going to go and I'll fulfill my... And for me, like, in Israel, it's, like, much more tribal. It's, like, no, like, your family is something for life and we will always take care of each other and there is no moment where you kind of, you know, move away from, like, th this, uh, yeah, inherited connection to, to the people that you're part of. How, how, is, how do you actually negotiate it with your life? Because you're quite... A, you live f quite far away from your family, no? It, how how does it feel for you, actually? I haven't been in the same country as my family since I was 15, 16. So... <laughs> you mean living, but you... Not like visiting. I visit, I visit. But I, I haven't been in the same country as my parents in a very long time. Um, I enjoy the freedoms that come with that because it allows me to really pursue what I want to pursue. I think moving away from the community is a, is a great path to growth. Um, however, I'm also very conscious of my role within my family, if that makes sense. Um, it's so funny because when I heard your example, and I think, yeah, I, I, a lot of Chinese families I know, you know, the, the kids are allowed to go and explore between the age of maybe. 20 to 24, and then at 25, 26, they have to come back and get married and fulfill like, all these family duties. Um, like the concept of filial piety is actually really strong here, where you come back and you take care of your parents and you take care of the community. Um, I'll be the first to, to admit that I'm really not very good at it, and I'm trying to do it from abroad, but I, I think in many ways that I've failed my family also um, because I'm not at home, because I'm not taking care of them. But my family also, to their credit, has never made me feel like a failure. They've always really supported me in my career and my ambitions. Um, I'm, I'm very, very lucky. I know very, very few girls who went to like primary and secondary school with me who got the freedoms that I have. I know maybe like three other girls who have not gone back home to Malaysia. Everyone else has, has gone back home to Malaysia to live with their parents um, and take care of them. And I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky. Um, there, there is a, also kind of a reason why. Um, my, my mother was the first person in her family to, well, not the first person, but my mother's generation was the first to uh, learn how to read and write. 
um, which is really different from Europe. Like, you know, your grandmother could probably read or write. Am I, am I correct in saying that? Uh, I mean, my mother side is coming from, uh, was born, my mother was born in Morocco and, uh, and my grandparents died before I was born. So actually, I'm not sure. I mean, I know that for sure my grandfather, he had a business, so I assume he, know, he knew how to write. <laughs> but I think also, yeah, I think, I think yes. That's what I think, but I'm not sure. Yeah, so in, in that sense, like, okay, there are like three big values here that we're talking about. We're talking about family, right? And we're talking about family and responsibility to the family. And then we're talking about education and then bettering yourself. And in my family, it's always been like, which path do you pursue? It's very, it's very split. So if you pursue the path of education and bettering yourself, then you better go take all the chances you can. Then you better go take all the risks you can. And my parents have been really supportive um, in allowing me to take a lot of risks. But the caveat is the risk. Like if I was going to go, I don't know, build a family in Arkansas, US, sorry, Arkansas, US, I'm sure you're a lovely place. I've never been there. But, or, you know, backwater Illinois or uh, uh, somewhere in the Philippines, I don't know, anywhere. But if I were to go raise a family in one of those towns that I mentioned, I think they would be livid. I think they would yell at me and fly there and drag me home right away. But because I was abroad in all these cities pursuing my career, they gave me more leniency that way. Um, also, I'm a girl. And... I technically cannot carry the family name. I mean, I could in modern day, but I can't really carry the family name. So it's, it's a little bit iffy, but and this is really interesting to talk about it with a European because I'd love to see their reactions. But girls are kind of like throw, uh, not like throw away, uh, oh, a little bit like, you know, you don't carry the family name kind of okay, whatever you want to do, because you're not going to carry our family name anyway, just as long as you don't disgrace it, it's like, oh, it's fine, she's a girl, she'll get married at some point. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's funny because, you know, like the, I, where I see like a kind of a lot of cultural conflict that on one hand, now in the West or, yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't want to generalize, like, but if, within the circle of people that I surround myself, there is a sense that as a non-white person, you can really have the space to assert your culture and to be proud of your culture because you have been marginalized. That's kind of the line of thinking. But then if I think about the ideas that are coming from your culture, they would be the first one to be completely, you know, like being attacked immediately on, a, on you know, like on the ground of feminism, on the ground of, a, of a, you know, like anti colonialism many many so it's interesting how that you know these conflicts they are actually present and uh, and i don't know you know and it's the, but the most interesting for me personally is that the thing that like that you maybe say like yeah i need i i was happy to have the freedom of that's the thing that i'm actually i want to be able to cultivate in my life and and the and the and the first thing that came in mind is the idea of taking care of your parents. So maybe first you can elaborate what does it mean in your context, in your culture, and in what is the expectation of the family of, of the parents to be taken care of, in which, in, to which extent? I, I would have to, okay. Taking care of, for me, taking care of my parents means that I have enough money to support them. It also means I have enough time to visit them and to take them to the doctor or just to hang out with them, generally spend time with them, uh, to take them on holidays. And taking care of my parents also means in some sense, like there is a, there's a sense of being able to participate in the family lineage. Like I would be taking their place so I would need to know where the family altar is. Um, I would need to, you know, know all the burial rites or the funeral rites, things like that. Uh, I would need to know everyone in the family by name and by position to me. Uh, so I would be taking over the family, like notebook, so to speak, you know, and keeping the family tree alive. I would be the one who would call and 
connect to all these like second cousins and third cousins and keep the family connected. Uh, so yeah, those are like three main responsibilities I can think of, which is already a lot. It's hard because my within my family also we're kind of we're kind of also new Chinese in the mentality that you know, we are we are fortunate enough to have put away enough financial reserves that I don't need to financially take care of my parents. Um, we are very fortunate in that sense. We are also very fortunate that both my sister and I were able to like not be married. We don't we don't have to get married. If we don't want to. Um, we don't have to have children if we don't want to. Um, we will not carry the family name like traditionally. We would not carry the family name. And thus, in that sense, it's a kind of freedom as well. We can do whatever we want with our careers. But the taking care of the family, like it's it's, it's really it's really full. It's a, like it, it's not just about having enough money to support your parents. It's not just about having like a couple of million dollars in the bank to take care of them. It also means like knowing who you know their sisters are, so my aunts, and connecting to them. And, then moving on to take, like if my mother passes away, I would still need to take care of my aunt. I would still need to check in with her. I would still need to like visit. Um, I would still need to call and, and, and try to make these connections, like to, to strengthen these connections. Like it doesn't just end with my parents, so to speak. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it does. And it's interesting because my wife is, I would say that my wife kind of intuitively is more aligned with where you grew up and I'm like the complete opposite. But now, like as I, since I had developed my own family and my own kids, I mean, yesterday I talked to my mother and and then she told me, yeah, you know, there is this uh, uh, kind of, uh, how do you say it in English? In, uh, like this kind of safe house for, for adult people, for like elderly people, elderly home or something like that, no? So she told me, yeah, I was, I, I had a conversation with them to check out how much it cost. And then I was like, oh my God, like my mother is actually considering going to this one of those places. And I was like, and I told her like, look, you come and live with us. We have a guest room, just be with us. Like we, you know, like see the, ki the grandkids. Now I know that it's like something that I kind of said immediately. And I know that if I would have to commit for what I said, it's going to be a lot of challenges there. But now I feel like actually, yes, this is, this is, this is, this should be part of my responsibilities. And this is something that I really, I don't appreciate in the culture where I grew up. And that's very common in the West, I think, that like at a certain age, okay, we just kind of stuck you with a lot of people like <laughs> in, in the same age of yours. And there will be, and we kind of outsource it. Somebody we, like, you know, we pay money, somebody will do the job for us. But I think that, yeah, I mean, and I mean, one thing that my wife keeps telling me is like, Look, the way you treat your mother is how you are teaching your kids to treat yourself. Like the way, you, and, and, and yeah, I don't know if, <laughs> if I want to end up in an elderly home, you know, being picked up for the holiday to eat some dinner and everybody's like, ah, oh, here's grandpa, the sinal grandpa, like let's pet him a bit and then we bring him back home. <laughs> it's quite sad. And I think that there is something very beautiful about the, like, I mean, where you're coming from in the sense of that, yeah, that, that it's part of your responsibility and you're not just, okay, I got everything from my parents and now I, that's my life, fuck everything behind. I mean, there is also a lot of space for abuse there, I know, but like... Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's like three parts, but also the part about the spiritual part that I didn't, I was like trying to think about it is that it is now my responsibility to pass on these stories. So for example, my mother, um, she speaks Hokkien, it's a dialect. There's no written form of Hokkien per se. So my mother inherited a lot of proverbs and these like poems basically from her, her mother, my grandmother. And I've been trying to accumulate them and write them down because I know when it's my turn, like even if I don't have kids, I have a responsibility to pass on this to the next generation, so to speak. So when my parents pass, I am now the keeper of their stories. You know, I'm now the keeper of their struggles, like their their success, you know, how they went from like both of my parents, their parents couldn't read or write, but they could. 
and they were always telling me how how difficult it was to you know do well at school because you didn't really have any home support and how they still had to do it right and then and it's sort of these like stories of struggle and hardship that are still so close because it's really still first generation to, to another right it's just passed down versus my partner his grandmother was a psychologist who authored eight books right so like and then you know his mother then was a worked in a, a social setting it worked in an office so basically the story of the three generations is pretty similar but the story of our three generations is quite not very similar like, came in a boat didn't know how to read or write went to college managed to do like you know go abroad for college um and i think keeping these stories so personal and so rich is also part of my responsibility if we think about taking taking care of the family um, the collective responsibility is also to keep the stories alive, is to keep the language alive, is to keep our customs alive. Like sometimes I, <laughs> there's a very weird custom in Chinese New Year. You don't uh, sweep your house, you don't clean your floors. If not, you will clean away the bad luck. But what it really stems from in my family is that you do all your work and this is the time that uh, you have three days to be really off and enjoy the food and hang out with your with your family and don't think about cleaning, don't think about cooking, because everything is done, everything is clean, everything is cooked. Like all you gotta do is just hang out and be with each other. And these are one of the customs that I actually would want to pass on. It's just like like I I would want to pass this custom on. Like yeah, Chinese New Year, three days. We don't do any cooking, we don't do any cleaning, we just hang out together. This is something that I want to keep through. That makes sense. Sorry. Yeah, yeah completely. No, it, it, you know, I'm. You know, when I hear all these stories, it's like, yeah, I re I really feel that it's like. First, I assume. I mean, I'm not an uh, an historian, but I can assume that the value of taking care of your parents is something that is not kind of a respond to neoliberalism and like, no, no, we actually need to do it, but it's actually it comes from. You know, ancient tribal tradition where I think that that the elderly had an important space place, and I think that nowadays, I mean, I think one of the reasons why like elderly people are kind of losing their respect in society is because a lot because of the the fast pace that technology is changing, and like I don't know, I think about my mother, everything that she knows. And the world that she grew up is completely, but completely irrelevant. You know, like sometimes where, where I see it extremely funny is like sometimes we communicate over WhatsApp and then at the end of the conversation, you know, they send you this automatic message to rate the conversation. If the conversation quality was okay, like like after you finish the the, the video call or whatever. And then, she's, she, <laughs> then she tells me, yeah, Matan, the, uh, don't worry, the, the, uh, the quality was bad, but I, I send them and they will do something now. You know, like... Which obviously, you know, nobody's going to do anything <laughs> when you just press rate the conversation. You know, maybe somewhere along the line, but for her, it's really like clear that there is a person who is like looking at what I wrote now and he's taking care because that's the model, that's the kind of economical model she grew up in. That if you're a company and you offer a service, it's not all automatic, uh, automated by like bots and, you know, like just, uh, you know, marketing strategies to funnel you somewhere so she really grew up in a different world and 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 of course like if i would l lean on her knowledge i will not make it anymore so it's a little bit hard to really preserve the value of and the knowledge of the elders but when but i think that there is also something else there and it's a little bit and that's something i'm learning through my kids that, that there is really like an emotional and spiritual value about about roots yeah, I, I do come from somewhere and you know, like I'm recognizing it after 12 years of living in Austria and kind of fulfilling my multicultural lifestyle dreams of being a man of the world, meeting people, you know, the podcast in a way is, is that space. I'm, I'm, I'm hosting all my friends from all over and it's really beautiful, but, but the more I'm, I'm alive, the more I feel actually, yeah, I do belong somewhere like, and do you you don't miss it at all? Like I mean, you're so I mean, you're so many years away already. But you said like yeah, I missed 
you t- you said that in New York you felt like yeah I, I wanted my own community so like I did isn't that something and you know it sounds really superficial to say this um, but I, I kind of like being a bit superficial at times because it's true I miss being around people who, who, who kind of looked like me who kind of thought, thought in the same way like me um, it was really tough for example in New York I, I would try to have a weekly call with my mother and But my boss, somebody I work at in a physical therapist's office, would be like, why do you need to call your mother every week? How do I explain this to you? But here, here, people go home for Sunday dinner. You don't socialize with people on Sundays because they go home, to their, they, they go home and have dinner with their families. Like, Sundays are for family. And I love that and I miss that. Like, it's just some of these things that... The older I get, the less I want to change. <laughs> and some of these things, I don't see a reason to change. I like that Hong Kong and the crazy, fast-paced lifestyle, hustler mentality we have here. People will still say no to me if I try to invite them to Sunday dinner. I love that. I love the fact that people understand where you know, I can switch out words. So I'm not very fluent in Cantonese, but every now and then I'll switch out an English word. And then I'll switch back to Cantonese. I'll just switch in and out. Um, and I love that people here kind of accept that instead of asking me, oh, sorry, one second. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Never mind. All right. He's just thinking it. Um, yeah, I, I really love that. I can speak multiple languages here and I can switch in and out. And people will understand me versus if I feel in New York, if I try to uh, speak to someone in English, I don't know the word for pencil in English and I say a Cantonese word, they'll just think I'm crazy. Uh, they would not forgive me. Versus here, oh, yeah, 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 you don't know the word for uh, chicken. I will, you know, I hear the English word for chicken and I'll still give you chicken. I love that. Yeah. No, there is definitely something to, some, some, there is definitely some values in those things. conservative family structures that uh, yeah I definitely I, I, again I, I rebelled a lot against many of them in my early childhood and my my kind of early adulthood but now I'm, I'm I allow myself to be to take a more centric position and to really ask what is the positive v- utility of those values and not just what they represent and I Hey, Steffi, Steffi, I said, it's funny, I call you now Steffi because I, I'm so used to German that for me, the, word, the name Steffi sounds the wrong name because in German you say Steffi. Yeah, too many years in Austria. <laughs> I want to I wanna up, open up like a little bit of a different uh, topic and let's see where it's going to where it's going to go because like we have a lot of similarities when it comes to our like training background. I mean, we're both been doing contemporary dance for many years and we are also been doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu for fairly the same amount of time really? so oh what do you what are you? yeah yeah I'm also like a, around five years wait are you a purple belt now no no I'm still a blue belt and you <laughs> I haven't trained since um well I've been training a little bit but not not consistently since COVID hmm yeah for sure also my training routine has been compromised a lot But I've been trying to, especially after I was, I, I got COVID. So then suddenly I was kind of an attractive training partner because, you know, I, I was like, <laughs> okay, with you, there's no risk of infection. So I could, I could sneak some sessions here and there, but uh, no, I'm still blue belt. Uh, 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 let's say like uh, ambitious, less blue belt. <laughs> I'm not trying to get quicker to anywhere with that, but yeah. Uh, But I've noticed, you know, like in the past several years, I've noticed kind of a trend happening within the, the, the dance world around Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. Did, did you also notice it? And like, what is your thought about it? Yeah, I'm going to say something really controversial here. But Jiu-Jitsu gives, okay, Jiu-Jitsu is so different from contemporary dance. In a sense, it gives you a bloody goalpost. It's like, this is what, it's very clear, black and white. You have to achieve this to be good. Just do this. And all the dancers are like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. Like, like you know, a triangle, a choke, they tap. Like, I win. 
wow, it was like years and years to come from, you know what I mean, choreographers were like, yeah, be a bit more soft. You're like, how soft? Like, like oh, you here, be this. And, and you know, it's like five paragraphs of qualities. And you're like, you want me to look like this? And they're like, yes, it's wonderful, do that. And I'm like, why couldn't you have just told me this? And I feel like there's so much frustration within the contemporary dance world in terms of feedback. We don't get very solid feedback. I, we don't get crystal clear feedback. And jujitsu is so affirming. It's, it's very clear. And the barrier to entry is really low. I mean, yeah, occasionally you might need to own a key, but you can also just borrow a key or make do with some with no key, right? The barrier to entry is, is so low. And the community is, I would venture to say, out of jujitsu, out of striking, because I've also wondered why striking is not so popular with dancers. And I think it's because of the risk of like head trauma. Um, also striking like looks a little bit more violent versus jiu-jitsu, even though I think it's equally as violent, it's a little bit more, uh, you know, the shapes involved, there's um, sequences of movement. Um, but I think the idea of having consequence is really attractive to a lot of dancers. So I'm going to be really controversial in saying it's just nice to achieve something. Like, ah, oh, like, oh, I tapped somebody, you know. It's like wonderful because you don't have you don't have the element of competition in contemporary dance. It's almost a bit like taboo to say, yeah. yeah. But yes, go on. No, no, it's because I think that we do have there is a lot of competition in the dance world, but it's not uh you know, it does, we don't lay it like transparently. Yeah, we are competing on certain things. I mean, you know, like, you go to an audition, that's a competition. And I don't know, in my dance school, I remember th- there was uh, uh, another guy in particular that we had like uh, during the education, we had some kind of tension between us and there was a, center, a, ce- a certain sense of competitiveness. But it's not, uh, you, ca- you can never say who is better. Yeah. I think so this, ambigu- this ambiguity maybe kind of, keeps it in the shadow because I don't know in jiu-jitsu it's like if you win you win it's just it's like you and, and nobody, you are better today yes yes and nobody cares and that's what I really love about it like okay I think what makes a good jiu-jitsu practitioner is very similar to what makes a good contemporary dance practitioner um I think like a sense of curiosity and hunger and humility are really important in both in both fields but in jiu-jitsu it's like I feel like contemporary dancers often take themselves very seriously. In jiu-jitsu, it's like, yeah, I have a neck injury. Sure, I'll go to take class this evening. It's fine. Like, you know, I'll just roll softer. You know, versus uh, stereotypically speaking, a dancer who is injured is like, no, 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 I can't do anything. I need to rest. I need to. Like, I'm out of you know, I'm out of commission for a little bit. Um, and this is this is completely generalizing. I'm, I'm very aware there are also dancers who just go back the next day after popping so many orders because they have to work for a show. And I'm very aware there are also jiu-jitsu practitioners who take themselves out at the smallest sign of an injury. Um, but the affirmation, jiu-jitsu gives you a lot more affirmation. And I think people in jiu-jitsu take themselves less seriously. So it's really refreshing for a contemporary dancer when they go into jiu-jitsu. Versus like and other like wrestling and MMA. I actually never met a dancer who did MMA, have you? I mean, I've done a bit of MMA, but very shortly. <laughs> right, right. I didn't really enjoy it. I was like, there's too much gear and not enough freedom and I can't be myself. You know, I have to. That was too much structure there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was really quite a... So it's, it's, I mean, I think it starts with like the kind of different cultures in MMA gyms versus jiu-jitsu gyms. I mean, I mean, f- first, when everybody is wearing this kind of traditional kimono, so even though the jiu-jitsu is not a traditional martial art in the sense of like non-competition and that, there's already some kind of a atmosphere that is uh, a little less, mm, how to describe it, like brute. You know, there is some elegancy. <laughs> and I don't know when I did. So th- there was a certain moment I, I moved to another gym here in, in, in Vienna where they were mixing, uh, especially Nogi Jiu Jitsu. And, and there was like Thai boxing, boxing and that kind of stuff. So just 
while we trained Jiu Jitsu there, you kept hearing people like hitting the, the, you know, the punching bags and you hear this boom, boom. <laughs> it's like you're already, <laughs> and you know, everybody is like wearing shorts and everybody has tattoos. So you feel like you're in kind of a different environment. But uh, yeah, it was interesting because, you know, after doing a few MMA sparring, Jiu Jitsu sparring felt like really relaxed. So that was a good, that was a good thing to take from those experiences. And I would curious to learn more, but, but yeah, I, I'm wondering if like, if it's just kind of a, um, I mean, I, I'm curious, like, are, are you a little bit judgmental about this trend or you are happy that it happens? No. That you see like more in... Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry to, to cut you off just now. Um, I, I'm really happy about it. I'm really happy when I see more dancers take agency of their body and when they take themselves a little less seriously. Um, and it's also that contact, uh, the fact that jiu-jitsu is, is so tactile, I, I think that's really, really healthy. And I don't think, again, being a bit controversial here, but I think the working conditions of most contemporary dancers today are horrible. I, I would never, I, 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 no, no. The rehearsal schedule, the stuff you have to do to get through, um, getting contracts at last minute. Um, I, I think all of that can leave you feeling very disempowered, especially for a female contemporary dancer. Uh, I've spoken to quite a few who also are like me, who are starting to enjoy martial arts more. And I think it's really healthy that more dancers are doing it because it also gives them a sense of regularity. That classes, if you go to the classes, maybe you want to compete. There's a competition for you. You can schedule yourself around it. You can train and have a plan. Um, it, it, feels, it feels more empowering in a sense. So yeah, I'm really happy. Um, yeah, I think it also it it it's a great balance for the the um, the the lack of symmetry between men and women in the dance world because I think that that's a little bit the opposite in jiu-jitsu. You no, know, if you're a female athlete, it's much easier to get sponsors. If you're if you're excelling a little bit, you know, like you arrive to the gym, it's already like, ah, oh, yeah, we need more women here. It's like. <laughs> No, did you experience that, or is um, it, or am, it's just it's, in my? It's becoming less and less here in Asia because a lot more women are taking up the sport. I actually think okay. it's growing really fast in Asia. I mean, it's always been quite popular. But six years ago, six years ago, was it different? Oh yeah, yeah, six years ago definitely. I mean, six years ago, I think I saw maybe at most one other female in the gym. Um, oftentimes, none. Like, and especially if, if I were, if I was training for a competition, I almost never saw another girl. Um, I mean, I trained with I trained with my coach a lot, and she was female, so that was nice. But yeah, nowadays I think more women are taking up the sport. I think also I think also in lieu of self defense, it is the most um, it's not the most attractive sport to women. But it's the sport that intrigues me, I think, for me most. Um, I've tried, I actually tried Muay Thai a little bit. Uh, and I also did like a little tiny bit of MMA. And it just wasn't as, it just wasn't as interesting. It wasn't as um, accommodating to my body. And that's also a nice thing. I think that's why a lot of dancers are attracted to Jiu Jitsu. Because you you can actually take the pace. Like I mean, not always, but you can actually go up to someone and say, Oh, I'm you know, rehearsing for a dance piece right now, I can't go too hard, can we just flow? It's becoming more and more accepted to to say that. Um, and I think jujitsu itself allows for diversity, stereotypically speaking, not every but sorry, general generally speaking, but it does allow for you know, different types of bodies, like more women, more men and women. Um, I, I see what's really popular right now is women who are a bit bigger. Um, they're actually really attracted to the sport because they come in at a weight level that's more similar to the men, so they can actually like really have a really have a go, <laughs> which is actually pretty awesome. Yeah, 
yeah so i think that's great yeah no because i i also think that there's like a lot of positive things about it i'm always a bit concerned when when in the, in the way we filter knowledge in the dance that it it kind of becomes like kind of a you know just the shell of something versus the because we want to use it for expression and then it's like and then it becomes kind of like a yeah like a superficial variation of the of the essential knowledge that is there but i think like culturally i find it like an interesting thing that to see to see those mixes and yeah and also yeah it, that's something beautiful about jiu jitsu i think that what you just said about the diversity of bodies this really reminds me of contact improvisation because i mean it's one of the only martial arts that there is really advantage big advantage to every any body type like in mma there is not really a a, a good advantage in being very small <laughs> Yeah, but in Jiu Jitsu, there you you can, you can adapt to that kind of body type, and 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 that's really remind me of contact improvisation. How it really doesn't matter if you're short, tall, wide, narrow, you know, like you, you, there is a way to to make the technique work for you. And that's a that's a nice for me. There there there's like so much similarities between the two. But you also mentioned like. Um, you brought the name, the, the word self-defense. And when I started jiu-jitsu, and I know I'm, I know I'm going to open here a, a more sensitive space with you. So, you know, feel free to also, you know, dictate the pace of how we go there. When I, when I entered the world of jiu-jitsu, for me, it was kind of a, a revelation of like, wow, this martial art is really physically designed for women because like you're really using you're not using strength, you're really using, like, uh, in the word of John Danaher, the, the, the asymmetry of strength between the lower body and the upper body. So like, you're lying on your back and you're using your legs, and suddenly, even if you're much weaker, you could temporarily become stronger than a bigger po opponent. And especially the fact that, like, you're, you're lying on your back and the position that you're supposed to feel safe is when you take your legs and wrap them around your partner waist. And for me, I felt like, wow, if this position that is the worst place you want to actually be as a woman with some stranger becomes the place where you feel the most secure, that could translate quite good into the realm of self-defense. So maybe let's start. Well, what do you think about my thoughts? Are there naive thoughts of a man? I, no, I don't think there are naive thoughts of a man. I think they are, um, they represent maybe just this part of the iceberg. So I believe that technique needs to be internalized and it can take someone a very long time to internalize the technique. It can take someone like a few months. Just because you learn jiu-jitsu does not mean you're good at self-defense. If you are, if you don't have, if you, if you don't have this protective inclination of yourself, um, I had to work really hard to match that up. Like I had this exterior that was all like, yeah, I can take someone down, like I can wrist lock, choke, like you know, all these techniques. And I had this interior that was still really submissive. So it takes a while to kind of match the inside and the outside, if that makes sense. Um, that's what I mean by the technique has to be internalized. I know, for example, if you relate the concept back to contemporary dance, Contemporary dance, we're supposed to release. But release can mean so many words, and release can mean so many different ways. Um, it takes a long time for a contemporary dancer to really internalize that quality of release and to kind of make it on stage. Uh, it's the same thing for a martial arts practitioner. You, you are really still a practitioner until you can sort of match up like like your ability to really truly protect yourself it's it's not that you're still just learning the techniques um I, I i bring this up because i did some some trauma work um so this is actually kind of like the interesting part and this is why yeah but i i feel like i should i should bring up the, the context 
Um, I'm not uncomfortable bringing it up. It has been almost two years, maybe a little bit less. Um, well, I was actually training for a competition about, about four weeks before I was sexually assaulted. Um, and at the time, you know, I was in the middle of my training camp schedule, so to speak. So my thoughts were, oh, I have to, well, I, I am going to compete. Like, I need to not risk anything to my body, you know. So my mentality was, hey, don't take this, like, limit all my acrobatic practice and try to focus on jiu-jitsu and try to limit risk and everything. And that was my thought also when I was sexually assaulted was, uh, I need to, you know, I, I, I work in a physical profession. Like, my first thing is always to prevent injury and to make sure I can still work, I can still train, I can still compete. Um, my mentality was really, was really self-preservation in the sense that I knew if I fought back, like this person was much bigger than me, much, much stronger than me, um, had trained for a very long time in, um, in strength and in gymnastics and in martial arts. And I knew like pound for pound, he would be much stronger. Than, than I was. And, and so my instinct for self preservation came up, and I had to make a very split decision to do so. Um, I, do, I do look back and I think, you know, this, this isn't really like a, a cry story or a victim story, because I do believe in that moment I still made the best decision for myself. And just to put it on, like I said, it was four weeks before my competition. I actually did still manage to go and compete. Um, and I won. Um, but, you know, that, that came at also a cost. So, you know, in that grounds, you could argue I did really well in my jiu-jitsu career. Like, went to a competition, had this incident happen, and so won. Well, in the grounds of self-defense, um, that was... That was really not what is supposed to happen. You know, you're supposed to be able to defend yourself against like assaulters and all of that. But that was in my mindset at the time. That was my my instinct or priority at the time. Um, I did a lot of trauma work to also understand um, and come to terms with it. it. It's it's not like I don't I don't believe I made a bad decision at the time. I do believe I could have made a better decision. I do question why I didn't have the instinct for self-defense. Um, but in the end, I can't, I can't really do anything about it. All I can really do is move on and try to sort of match up like my ability to really truly protect myself with the, with the practice that I'm pursuing right now. Does that make sense? Mm. <laughs> I don't know if I came oh. across this very quickly with there. No, uh, first I wanna I wanna acknowledge that I'm really touched by the fact that you are willing to share this story with me, and I don't take it for granted. I really I'm I'm really honored by by having this conversation with you, and and I don't know if it's if it's about making sense or not because I think that those situation, yeah, it's really really hard to. I mean, I, I, I really appreciate what you said, like I, that you believe, yeah, I took, I took a good decision for me back then, but I could have acted in a better way versus like saying, you know, it was all wrong because, uh, because you're still here and that's, and self-preservation, I think it's, it's, that's the essence of self-defense at the end. But, uh, but yeah, I wonder like, what is, what does it mean to internalize technique then? Because, uh, I don't know, I had a conversation with my Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu coach also on the podcast and, and he was portraying the, the idea of, uh, of self-defense as kind of an internal mindset that knows that, that ha like to develop the ability to assess risk and to just prevent from, actu from actually entering into a risky situation. So he said, for example, that when he's standing in the, in the, in the underground station, he just makes sure to position himself where there is a wall behind him. So then nobody can come behind him. And, and he differentiated between being afraid and then just being cautious. 
so that you don't need to always be afraid, but you're just, okay, I'm just taking the smarter decision in that situation. But, uh, but I think that it's a very, very difficult thing to, to really be precise with. And, and I don't know if, like, I don't know if, what, 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 what do you think? Like, I don't know, from like going through that and being where you are now, so what would you think that would be yeah. this better yeah. path that you said I would have taken? Yeah, I, I, I made a list of priorities about my body after, and I kept adding and subtracting to that. You know, and my mindset about injury has actually changed since then. Um, now I think if this situation would have happened to me again, I might be, I, I'm, I'm a lot better about going through injury. So, so for example, to use the example of like the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu coach, uh, if I was in a dark alley, you know, and I, I had to like protect myself or defend myself, um, I would actually be more willing to incur an injury in order to protect myself than to just let things happen. Like now my mindset towards injury is less oh, avoid at all costs. Um, so I think that's one thing, like my the priorities about, about my body have, or the priorities about my body are strengthened. I, I know I am a bit more clear about what is important to me. And also my mindset about injury has has changed um like i'm less willing to so at the time it was really interesting because i was also teaching a lot i was teaching full time uh, and i was trying to kind of make it as a prison jiu-jitsu competitor and you know the ego of all that i have to admit i was also kind of like caught up in all that i wanted to be the best teacher i could be I want to be the best Brazilian Jiu Jitsu competitor. And in everything, you have to sacrifice. Um, I came across a really great quote recently by a friend of mine. His name is Flynn Disney. He's, he's an amazing parkour practitioner. And he talked about how virtue without sacrifice is poison. Um, and, you know, every time now I think back to the incident when I'm trying to. Uh, they reframe the trauma. Uh, I think I think back to that, and I think I think back to the value of, of sacrifice. Um, so to go back to the technique being internalized, you know, I, I I think there is an element of sacrifice there. Like you, you have to you have to sacrifice something to learn to learn about yourself. Um, I in a sense I I sacrificed something to learn. I sacrifice X to learn Y about myself. Um, and this is, is helping me in my journey now as a martial arts practitioner, if that makes sense. Mm. You know, I, I, I can resonate with this quote. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, I, yeah, there is a, um, another thinker that i like to hear his thoughts his name is thomas sol and he, al he also says like that yeah like uh, there there are no improvement there are just like compromises like you there is no pure uh situation where you just have pure benefits you there is always a cost to whatever you're doing in life and but i don't know i'm really thinking because you know like when when my daughter was born so I discovered inside of me <laughs> this kind of <laughs> very animalistic dad that want to make sure that she will be fine in the world, you know. And, and then I started to ask a lot the question, what does it mean to grow somebody that will be fine in the world? And like, what, what are the active things that I can do? And, and one thing that I question a lot now after observing her, handling herself in the kindergarten and... And I wonder what you think about it is like that that people who are like more agreeable in their nature, like that their personality is more like, you know, avoiding conflict and, you know, trying to make sure that everything is in harmony. So I I assume that their reaction will be a bit slower when, you know, when something bad is happening. And 
Um, I, I mean, and, and that's just, just as an observation that I've seen in the kindergarten, like that there is one girl who is extremely disagreeable, extremely like, you know, when she wants something, she doesn't like, she, she doesn't care for authority. She goes through. And I've noticed that, you know, she doesn't take shit from anybody in the kindergarten. Like, and, and it doesn't mean, it doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a, if it's a boy, a girl, an adult, you know, she's kind of standing for herself. And I've seen many situations where my daughter, you know, she had a confrontation with a kid that was younger, physically weaker, and, and she really like, there was some inhab internal inhibition to go into the conflict. Even that the result was like compromising some aspect of what she needs, but again, like also preserving something else. And I don't know, I mean, I don't know if, if this theory <laughs> has any value, but you know, it's just an observation. And I wonder like, how much our personality also plays a role in the ability to internalize, you know, those, because Jiu Jitsu is teaching us very clear external boundaries. But as you said, like you have to act to, to exercise those boundaries. It's not just yeah. automatically. Yeah. Yeah. Jiu Jitsu doesn't do that automatically for you. With that, I do agree. But I think with children, what's really interesting is they're forming their personalities, but they're also forming their stress responses. And they learn that a lot they learn that like you know the the common stress responses are uh, fight flight freeze and also i recently learned fawn is another one Wait, which one fawn, the last one fawn f-a-w-n and what does it mean ah this is really interesting so a lot of a lot of dancers i know have the stress response to uh, a certain kind of choreographer uh so fawning is a stress response where You'll find this a lot in actually cases of sexual assault where um, the person who's been raped uh, will start to try and protect the, the person who raped them. So they oh, it's a bit like Stock Stockholm syndrome, something like that, no? Yes. In that lines. Yes, it is. Um, it's, it's considered as it's it's considered a stress response now, um, where a person just tries to protect the other person who raped them. And you actually also see this a lot in children who have who come from environments where they don't feel very secure. So they don't, they don't have a sense of safety. They don't have a sense of security. Um, maybe it's like caregivers who are in and out or their primary caregiver is um, not really there or not really able to give them attention or love. Attention, maybe just attention, not love, just attention. Um, you see this a lot in children, actually, the following stress response and um, I'm not a child psychologist by any means. I've, I've worked a lot with children, and that's actually something I want to do one day, is to actually study child psychology. Um, but when it comes to self-defense, you know, I don't think we teach, we don't teach, <laughs> we don't teach a person self-defense according to their stress response. It's really funny, because we think in terms of jiu-jitsu, like if you're tall or you've got long legs, you know, you learn the triangle, right? Uh, you got like short legs, like, yeah, let's do deep half, you know, perfect for you. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you, you are, uh, you know, you don't, you, you don't like to like uh, change levels very quickly in your body. Okay, don't do takedowns, like, like learn this other technique, you know, uh, shit like that, right? Like you try to formulate the jiu-jitsu that is good for your body, that is healthy for your body, that's advantageous maybe for your body. But we don't teach self-defense techniques that are advantageous to your natural stress response. And this is something that I was also like working with is that I don't naturally have a winner's mindset. I have a protective mindset. Like I have a scarcity mindset. I'm like, I already have so little. Let me preserve what little I have. And every opportunity I get to add more, I will do so. You know? But I have like a, I'm a very risk adverse person. Um, that's actually extremely interesting what you're <laughs> starting to open up here. I know, I know, dude, I know. Uh, but so this is really interesting because like, you know, in the sense like when I'm trying to, let's say I'm in a compromising situation, like my, like what I should be doing to protect myself, to defend myself, is actually learn how to negotiate. Is to learn how to verbally negotiate instead of physically like try to beat someone down. Right? Because I'm already risk adverse. I want to protect myself. I don't want to injure myself. That's my natural instinct. So what should I do? And some would argue I should start to almost negotiate with my 
maybe a sultan is like, hey, like, you know, what can I give you in return? How can we do this instead? What's another way? And this is actually more in line with my personality and my stress responses. That makes sense. Because my natural stress response is also to freeze. Um, it's not really to fight. <laughs> and so then I would argue, you know, uh, depending on a person's natural stress response, like we can teach them a better self-defense technique. Like for your daughter who doesn't like um, confrontation, a lot of people don't like confrontation. And there are better ways to express that. You know, there are better ways to get around that techniques that we, that we don't commonly think of. Like physical, physical skills are not the only way to get out of a tricky situation. Um, yeah. I wish I learned a long yeah. time ago. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, what I appreciate from, from, I mean, there's a lot of interesting things, but like first, like the tech acknowledgement that the physical skills, they are just like the, the, the shell, like they're, okay, it's part of self-defense, it's the shell, it's like, okay, in a situation, you also need to know that, but it's not the core. And also, yeah, I was, I was thinking about my daughter and like, uh, I mean, when, when she was around two, two years old, my wife and I had a really big crisis in our marriage. And part of the crisis was that we had very aggressive fights at home. And sometimes she also witnessed it. And when I kind of reflect on it now with you, I think like that a lot of, I mean, one of the things that she learned is like, it's kind of, I want to, I want to be the one who please everybody that it, that it comes back into normality. So it's like, like, if you're angry on me, I don't want to be in this situation where you're angry on me. I will just please you that you won't be angry now. And then we can be all together again. We can preserve the harmony that was lost. And, and maybe that's kind of like the the environmental factor that taught her this kind of stress response. And, and yeah, I, it would be really interesting to, to see if there's anybody else who is thinking those thoughts about self-defense and developing those different curriculum based on, on, the, on those psychological parameters. Because yeah, I guess that it's... It, it, yeah, I mean, I think some part of me knew that this kind of fantasy about jiu-jitsu and self-defense is just a fantasy. But nevertheless, I was wondering, and that's another thought, is if by doing this practice, because for me, when I go to jiu-jitsu, and in that regard, it was also present in any martial art that I did, and then I face the sparring situation, I do have to confront this kind of sometimes fear, sometimes like, okay, I'm not sure that like, am I ready for this? Okay, I have to commit. Like you have to face these kind of challenges that are not only physical, you are also meeting them on an emotional level, in a safe environment. So it's not every time, you know, there's many people that I can, you know, I can wake up and start rolling with them, but there are some people in the gyms, especially if, if I confront with somebody who's much bigger than me, I know, okay, now I have to be cautious. I don't want to have any injury. I need to... So I do confront some emotions that I think that are in some way related to it, but maybe it's just not enough. I don't know. Yeah. I wonder, statistically speaking, um, Okay, so basically speaking, yes, people who are bigger than you, so if they're 20, you don't want ever to spar with someone who is like 20 kgs heavier than you, because statistically speaking, you're more likely to get injured. But I always wondered about the other thing. Like statistically speaking, if you spar with someone who's really, really good, but much lighter and much faster and much more agile than you, statistically speaking, how much more likely are you to get injured? And I argue at either spectrum, you're very likely to get injured. Um, you're likely to injure yourself when you're sparring with someone smaller because you overestimate. I, I do think when you spar with someone smaller, you kind of overestimate their, their skill level. Uh, and when you spar with someone who's heavier than you, either you get injured because of strength, the disparity in strength and size, or you might get injured because you just overtax yourself and you gas yourself out. So this thing about size, I, I've really been learning like recently as I'm coming back to jiu-jitsu, I, we have a <laughs> kind of like sizes mentality like, when a lot of big guys now, and also this is like the evolution of jiu-jitsu, which I really like, is that a lot of big guys are also realizing that, oh, people don't want to roll with me if I keep injuring them. Like, I got to be careful. I have to pull back. And as a consequence, like, they sometimes get more injured 
because they're holding back, because they're not wanting to exert their strength when they can. Um, so it's, a, it's a really interesting like phenomenon that I, I'm, I'm seeing right now, and I like I'm wondering statistically speaking, how likely are you to get injured when you spar with someone who's much much bigger or much much smaller? And then again, this depends on the irritation. Yeah, I mean, my, my I can say like that, you know, the, the 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 most clear example I had was with your uh, with your ex coach with Margo, because because when wh before we met, I I I mean, you know, when we met in Ka in Castle and we had this plan to do some dance and jiu jitsu exchange, and so for me, I thought like, okay, I mean, I'm still like heavier and I'm quite in a good shape and I'm quite explosive in comparison and, I've, and, and I, I was quite sure that no matter what this is gonna save me but I've been toyed by Margot like never before you know and I felt like so helpless so for me this experience was like okay if this would really be life of death situation I actually don't want to fight with her <laughs> you know it's like <laughs> you and a lot of people trust me it's almost like and it's that mental yeah, yeah. Like, sometimes smaller people are just devious. Like they do stupid shit. I have this one really small chick in my gym who is just devious. Like she catches onto your heel, and of course everyone is terrified because I mean, okay, heel hooks are still relatively new, and yeah, like you know how to defend, but you also know the consequence. You definitely know the consequence, and when she traps your heel, you just freeze, and you know she knows that, and she just takes full advantage, and you're like devious little shit but it works it works yeah completely and 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 uh, yeah so this was like a really kind of uh, interesting experience of really feeling this helplessness with some i mean and i and i did experience it also in the gym with smaller guys but i would say that like the gender factor made it even more distinct because i never had this experience that a, a more advanced female Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner you know like destroyed me so easily <laughs> I, I just didn't have this experience and also when I came back home and I shared it with my coach they were like no no really no like, they, they, it was hard for them to believe to which level of of helplessness I was there and and then it, and I and then I still wonder if it if the technique on the external level is so internal is so extremely developed would you think that it's still not enough when it comes to like the internal internalization of it in the context of self-defense or there you think it's already valid? I mean, I know it's just thoughts and we are not talking from experience, but nevertheless. Wait, can you repeat that question one more time? So like, okay, so for example, you and I, you have, you, you've studied more jujitsu than me and you, and you have a more refined technique, but the difference between your te jiu-jitsu technique and my jiu-jitsu technique, I can overcome it maybe with extreme aggression and power and strength. With Margo, it wasn't the case. When I tried it, I paid for it. <laughs> so my question is like, when, when the technique does grow to such extreme sophistication, do you still think that it's, there is a space to walk in order to internalize it? in a self-defense context, or you think that this is already a manifestation of the internalization when the technique is so refined? Is it clearer, my question? Yes, that is clearer. I, I don't believe you can get to that level of sophistication and refinement in your movement um, as a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner if you haven't gone through the fire. I do believe you have to go through a certain amount of like crap and just like really, really horrible situations in order to, well, maybe not horrible, but really difficult challenges um, to get to that level of refinement. Um, so yeah, I do, I do think at her point, at her, in her stage of her, of her journey as a practitioner, uh, I do, I do believe the her technique is is very much internalized. She has kind of is she's trying to move beyond that, which I think is really interesting. Like I think some of the newer stuff is really really interesting. Um, 
I don't I don't really know what it takes to get there. I have a lot of speculation, but I don't really know what it takes to get there. Because if I were to compare that level of refinement to yours in contemporary dancing, for example, or in acrobatics, you can do a lot of other things really effortlessly. You know, and you don't, it, it's a different kind of mentality when you get there. Yeah, it's, it's not effort, if that makes sense. Like one of the things that is so nice about a practitioner who is like so high level is the level of effort that they put into it. It's seemingly effortlessness. That, that flow is really apparent. And that's what I love the most. Um, I don't believe you can get to that stage without putting in a lot of hours, without putting in like a lot of self-questioning, without putting in a lot of self-work. I do believe you have to grow you know, yourself like mentally and spiritually and also yourself physically in order to get there. Yeah, actually, you know, I mean, I, I think that it's definitely not a, a, a sustainable model to tell everybody, okay, in order to be good in self-defense, you have to dedicate your life completely to that practice. For sure, it's not sustainable. But, you know, I, while we are speaking, I actually, I, 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 I did remember that there was an incident with an, M with an American MMA fighter called Anthony Smith. I don't know if you heard about it, but he... Somebody broke into his home. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and then when you hear when you hear him speak about it, it really like you know, it kind of breaks your illusion about about self defense because like he's a trained killer. You know, you put him in a ring with ninety nine point nine percent of the human beings, and they and you know he will come victorious in a second but he 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 said like that he was terrified and like he shared like a lot of vulnerable thing and it was like really interesting that even when you're like really really trained athlete that is doing it all day like as you said like there is certain things that you need to go through before you can actually yeah 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 i, I guess that yeah like to some extent this is a realm that you cannot yeah that experience matters above all maybe but nobody wants to experience it. That's the contradiction about it. No, like you, like how do you? What do you do? Like do you go and start having street fights in order to be experienced in self-defense? It's crazy. It's a crazy offer as well. Yeah. But yeah. I don't know. It's uh, uh, there's this um, there's this foundation in the U.S. called the Elizabeth Smart Foundation, and they're they're trying to promote self-defense for for girls. Um, and they do a pretty good job of it. They do a pretty good job of like putting out these courses in uh, three different cities. Um, and they have a very structured curriculum that gives you like lots of techniques and like good for your body type and good for girls. But, and, and not to like criticize that foundation. You know, if someone from the foundation ever hears this, this is not a criticism. But their curriculum is based on the assumption that girls are weak, right? And there are actually some girls who are strong. And there are actually some girls who are, I've, I've met some girls who are actually, who actually had to fight a lot from, um, from when they were kids who were involved in street fights. It's not just boys, you know. So there are like a lot of assumptions made in kind of like the self-defense world. Going back to this point um, about this MMA fighter, there are a lot of assumptions that MMA fighters, it's still a profession at the end of the day. Just because you're a contemporary dancer doesn't mean you can teach anatomy. Just because you're a trained MMA fighter does not mean you, know, you go against like, someone with a gun. You wouldn't know how to dismantle someone with a gun. It doesn't mean you could be a, you could work for the FBI if you are an MMA fighter. Like I was very inspired by a lot of uh, I've been like reading a lot about um, uh, terrorists of late, <laughs> just like how people like negotiate with them. You know how you have to bring off an interpreter. And this is the part I was really interested in, in terms of communication. Um, how hard it must be, if you think about it, how hard it must be to, to negotiate in a language that is not yours, to have to listen to someone interpret everything you say you know, to the other side. And I think about this in the context of like jujitsu also, how hard it must be to be someone who is like so trained and you want to communicate all of these skills to someone else, but but you can't. 
you just can't. There's always going to be things lost in translation. Like, it's just, yeah. Like, I think self-defense is so personal and the person, like, even if you have the best intentions, like, you can't communicate to them the level of danger, the level of threat, what really is the best way to get yourself out of this. Like, you know, if you're in a situation where you really, really have to defend yourself, then you can would you also be okay knowing that you know this could be it? Like that's also something that we we I hear a lot, um, or I read about a lot when it comes to negotiating with terrorists. That you have to be prepared for the worst case scenario, and this is something that we don't talk at all in self defense. The notion is always like, yeah, do this wrist lock, like do this Aikido movement, you'll be fine. You will, you know, like punch your here, or run away really quickly, and you'll be fine. And no one ever tries to prepare you for. Okay, like worst case, this happens. What do you do next? I think there needs to be more because the worst case scenario happens more often than we think. It's like in jujitsu, you prepare for loss. So it's like, why would you not prepare for the worst possible outcome in self defense? Like, why do we not just teach people to be okay with the worst possible outcome? Which, again, again, I'm not saying we should all give up, but just saying. No, no, I mean, it's right because, uh, yeah, there is this, uh, how does it go, this cliche, like, you know, like you have to hope for the best and prepare for the worst, no, this kind of thing. Yes. Uh, I hire in mantra. Now when I hire people, I'm like, yes, we assume the best, but we expect the worst. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, let's say that uh, it's a very... Um, yeah, there is a lot of utility in that approach. But I think that maybe maybe that's something that I'm realizing with conversing with you is that like that because those spaces are so connected to our psychology, to our emotions, to our responses. So the the thin line between empowerment and re-traumatization is so thin that it's almost impossible to walk on it because yeah like when i imagine i don't want my girl my, my my girl to go into a room where they will keep telling her about all the worst thing that can happen to her and, and you know like kind of brainwash her into the terror of life you know there is this sense no i want i want her still to believe that the world is just like you know uh, you know fairy tale and uh, you know, the the good ones always win you know these kind of things and but as you said, like, uh, it's not realistic. Yeah, I don't know. It's, yeah, and you know, this theme keeps on coming in the podcast about generally about teaching, that in teaching we do have to, like, if you want to teach somebody, you need to enable them to be in a place that they are not comfortable. And then, you know, the potential there is always to kind of come out and feel like be- worse than, than better. But without entering this discomfort, you're just kind of enjoying yourself and nothing is growing. Hey, Matan, I wanted to say something about um, the sexual assault because I realized also just now when I was talking, um, I really was trying to make you feel comfortable because I know it's a particularly uncomfortable topic for men, for my male friends when I talk about it. Um, There's always a surge of, oh, like, I wish I could have helped you. But one of the things that like my, uh, my assault made me realize is that It made, it, made me, it made me realize a lot of things about the way I take care of myself and the way I process trauma. It was a really, I tend to gloss over it when I talk about it. I just, I just want to make the other person feel good. You know, it's like, I, I don't want to tell you the bad shit. I just want to be like, yeah, I'm okay now. I'm fine. You know, like what all cancer patients do. You know, someone starts to feel sorry for them. I don't, I don't want that sense of self-pity, but I, in trying to make you feel comfortable, I also just brushed apart the hardest things, and I, what came out of that was a huge drop in my self-confidence, in, um, in my identity as a woman, <laughs> in my identity as a as a like an advocate for for women, um, it was just like 
nose dive all the way. Uh, and but but what was great about that, and this is not me trying to gloss over and brush it off. What was really great about that was I really got a chance to question everything. I had to question everything. I had to start my like, almost from scratch to rebuild my ideas about myself, to rebuild my ideas about you know, defending myself. Um, and again, to rebuild these ideas of priorities for my body and what 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 my fears really were. And that's why I came up, I, I, I brought up the understanding and being okay with the worst possible scenario. Like knowing that I have been through not the worst possible scenario, the worst possible scenario is there, you know, helicopter is shooting, no, no, there are jets shooting bombs up here. Like that is like maybe a worst case scenario. I'm losing everything I have, maybe that's the worst case scenario. But knowing that I could survive something, that was really actually very empowering. It was really actually very good to know I could endure this. Um, and again, like going back to when you talk about teaching and putting back people into uncomfortable situations in order to help them to grow, like what people come out of this knowing, what my students come out of this knowing is that knowing that they could endure something and come out the other side, it's also so very positive because we don't have a lot of opportunities for that these days. Life is so comfortable. <laughs> you know, you know where your food comes from. You don't have to go to the jungle. You don't have to worry about if you leave your wife and kids. You know, would you come back? You know, like, like, like we do not live in countries where we have to worry about our survival every time we step out the door. At least touch wood, not yet. Uh, like, yeah, like, yeah. It, it really is as cliche as it is. Like, it was a really good opportunity to. To look in and rebuild and redefine for me. Yeah, I, I want to say, you know, like that for me, actually, first, it was a little bit the opposite. I felt that, like, until I would open up this topic with you, I would not feel very comfortable. <laughs> because you, you shared it to me just briefly. And for me, it's like one of those things that, you know, like, when you shared it to me that it happened. And as you said, like in, this, in, the, in our first conversation, you kind of brushed it quickly, like, yeah, but I'm fine and everything. And I feel like, hey, man, until I open this up with Stephanie, I'm not going to feel 100% okay with myself because that's what friends do. So like for me, it, I, it, it felt a little bit like I cannot feel completely transparent with you until we open this sphere and it, like, because it's, it's just how, and that's something that definitely shifted. I wasn't always like that, but now it's, it becomes very clear for me that that's, that's what friendship is about, is about being able to hold unsensitive spaces together and going through them versus like, you know, kind of just, no, I just want the fun, just, I just want to drink bubble tea with you and do jiu-jitsu and th that's our friendship. No, no, it's not that. And, uh, and yes, and it's, uh, and, and, and what I can resonate, and, and it's not about comparing traumas, because I don't think that it's actually really something that we can really do. Even, I mean, yeah, I can, when you said like, that's not the worst thing, maybe death was the worst thing. Yeah, we can do some hierarchy, you know, like of maybe external injustices. Let's say it like this. A uh, Holocaust survivor went through something that is absolutely externally more unjust than what you went through. But it doesn't mean that the experience of trauma is as the same correlation to the external reality and maybe because you see like i, I mean I, I mean in israel you I, I had the chance to hear a lot of holocaust survivors and some of them they really became you know like uh they they it, it, it almost like they developed more the ability to trust somehow at the end of the process like they, it really made them see like wow, we are all so vulnerable, like, that's why we should really take care of everybody. Like, like it really shine for them the, 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 the common humanity. And, but I can definitely identify with you that like, when I compare it to the trauma that I went around the circumstances that me and my wife shared, that the same question came up. 
my identity, my priority, how can I preserve myself? What are the things that are important? Like it's really like the, through those experiences that we, well, that we do these big leaps. No, like you have, you, as you say, like you, we have to dive nose down, you know, embrace for impact and start collecting what is there. And hopefully there is enough to collect that you can rebuild something and not just, and I guess that maybe the, the thing that I'm thinking that like some people are not fortunate enough to just experience one trauma and then have their life kind of slowly get together. But some people do experience like continuous traumatization. And, and then it's like, then of course, then, then there is the, the need for solidarity and for friendship and for, for other people to take care of you that for, you know, like, and so I, I really identify with you about this kind of self owning your trauma and working with it. But on the other hand, I think it's, that's why I, I felt that I want to somehow listen to those stories because I want to be part of it and I want to be, yeah, I want to, even if, you know, I know that I'm not playing a really meaningful role in your life. We, we, we met and we had great connection, but whenever we speak to each other, I do feel like, yeah, I can under, like we can resonate with each other. And, and for me, it's a great thing to actually be part of it, even in, in this kind of format. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful to, to have you as a friend. Like, but like, as you say, hmm, actually, I don't know. I sometimes appreciate people I haven't talked to in a long time, and then I get to catch up with them, versus people I talk to more regularly. Um, because there is a sense of anticipation that's like so exciting. Like, I ran home and I was like, oh my gosh, I get to talk to my time. I never get to talk. Time. Like, I get to talk to the time. I get to talk to the time. Well, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> so, it's like seeing the relative that you never get to see, but who always brings presents. It's like, oh, I get to see the uncle. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's a, that's a, I'm, I'm going to try to embrace this image. I'm the surprising uncle <laughs> for my guest in the podcast. St Stephanie, yes. yeah. you know, uh, I we do come. We are slowly coming to a point that I think we need to to conclude the conversation. And I do want to offer you some space to share with the people who are listening to where they can catch up with you, or like where, where, what are the spaces that you're cultivating now. If people are interested to keep hearing from you or studying with you, because I think that you are an incredible person, and I really can highly recommend people to engage with whatever you're offering. So I would be happy to give you some platform to share. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate this. Um, I, I, I had this reaction because I'm actually trying to remove myself away. Like I'm slowly starting to peel myself away from different cultures. Um, and I'm like rebuilding my, my community from scratch or my inner circle, so to speak. Not, be, not because I, I don't have rich relationships or I, I, I don't have friends I, I care about a lot um, or things that I'm passionate about that I want to talk to. I just think I'm in the process of building my cave right now and I'm trying to work on um, actually a couple of new projects and new endeavors. Uh, hmm. We, we talked a bit about before this how I, I'm really hard to find on social media. Um, I'm really, there, there's not a lot about me on other movement, culture, blogs, and so on. I actually, I actually have said no to a couple of podcasts before this because I don't really like to talk about, you know, I, I'm in a very unique position in the sense that I have studied in the US. I have been part of the movement culture scene there, and now I'm in Hong Kong. So I, I'm, I'm in a really unique and a really amazing position to do so. But I, I really shy away from, from talking about myself and my projects because I, I kind of wonder, like, am I really that important? You know? My thing is always like, it doesn't, I would prefer if you were learning from someone who is like living next to you in your community rather than a 
can say it, sorry, pay for online coaching <laughs> from someone who isn't part of your culture, who doesn't know your lifestyle, who can't relate to it. You know, I, I'm not trying to diss people who uh, you know, make their living off online coaching. I'm, I'm not at all. But sometimes like the best thing you can do is really invest in your own community and the teachers who are already here in this culture, sorry, in your own culture. Um, so I'm really trying to, to build more. I'm really trying to build, to build the people around me in Hong Kong. Um, but that's a very long-winded way of saying what I'm trying to do right now is job creation. So I've been working very long as, as an artist. Um, and I've always wished for someone to advocate for better pay for me, for better job opportunities, um, for safer job opportunities, and a sense like a more stable lifestyle. And so try for me as my platform to hire people who are really good movers, um, who are really passionate about what they do, who really love their craft, and who want to share it with other people. Um, and this year, like, touch wood, despite the pandemic, like, we've actually increased, and now we have a... Uh, like almost 15 coaches, and hopefully 16 and 17 coming soon, which is really exciting for me. Um, like this, this is this, I don't know, to like someone who runs, you know, Amazon or something, but like 17 coaches, like, what the fuck is that? I'm like, oh, this is a really big deal. This is me giving back to people I really care about. It's like me hiring, you know, local teachers and like trying to build something for them. I think that is really exciting. Um, so that's really where I'm moving towards right now. There are all the projects that I'm actually leaning towards is around like job creation for, for teachers, for coaches. Um, I'm still teaching a lot. Um, I don't do, I don't do online coaching. I have, I, I actually do, I have coaches who work with me online. So I'm very familiar with that moment. Uh, I don't offer it because it will take away from my craft, which is here with my community. Um, and I teach mostly kids <laughs> because it's a very strong choice. Uh, I've been teaching adults for uh, the last like eight years. And I, I, am, I am still going to teach adults. I'm not going to completely like, uh, push away that community either. But I really, really love working with kids. And my next project is actually going to involve more kids. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I love Sorry, I, I have sorry. So I, I have to I have to say it for you. So like for everybody who's listening, if you are visiting Hong Kong and you have kids, you have to go to tribe and go to <laughs> Stephanie's classes because I'm sure your kids will appreciate it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what's been really exciting about Tribe is that we are really the first movement gym in Asia to have such a multidisciplinary approach, and we're really the first place like, I would say in Hong Kong. Uh, sorry, babe. Can you give me a moment? Okay, thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, I, I hope you can edit this out. And I just edit what I'm gonna say now, but um, a Tribe really is the first. Thing disciplinary movement space in Hong Kong that allows someone to play and also learn really technical skills. Um, we are trying to do this, this big project of like bringing in really talented and passionate teachers in and also give them a really stable job base. So that is like where I'm focusing on a lot. Um, we're trying to build a really family-friendly space for people to bring their kids in, to also train with them, and to watch their kids grow in, in the space. Um, that hasn't actually been done in Asia. So, or it's been done in like small scale, but not in the scale that we're trying to do. So it's a very ambitious project, and I'm still trying to, to train myself. I'm still trying to teach, I'm still trying to practice my craft, uh, and I'm trying to, to build a business, which is all super exciting. But yeah, if you ever come to Hong Kong, I would, I would love to have people at my space, like you especially at my space. Yeah, uh, yeah, and maybe I can add to that that, you know, like 
you were really inspiring for me when I came to Hong Kong and, and when I got to know you and see the space and how you manage things. And there is definitely, it was, it, it, it's definitely played an important role in like putting some seeds in me that now are growing. And I really, really appreciate what you said about like invest in your local community. And, and this is where you would find like the, like, you know, the hidden treasures that are maybe not as shiny as the international scene, but they are much more real. And, and yeah, I, more power to you. I really wish you all the best with this project. And I hope, I really hope that life can bring me to visit you again there because it uh, was a real pleasure. I hope so. Too. And we haven't seen our new facility, so we actually moved to a bigger space now. Um, and that's why we're, we're trying to almost hire more people. So this can be a pitch for if you're interested in working in Asia, you should definitely contact me. <laughs> 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 so yeah, anybody out there who is ready to relocate to Hong Kong, you have a great person to contact. Hey, yes. Stephanie, yeah. it's been a real, real pleasure. I really want to thank you for giving me so much time and, and sharing me so many valuable things. And yeah, I hope that we can uh, do it more often and maybe even in live. Me too. Me too. Thank you for having me. If you want to see more precious and insightful moments, make sure to check our short clips playlist. To see longer interviews, check out the full episode playlist just below it. And to be notified for all future videos, click the subscribe button and don't forget to hit the notification bell. See you on the next episode.